Reflections. Good evening, and thank you very much for being with us uh, tonight. Uh, I am joined this evening by State Representative Jason Perillo, who represents uh, the city of Shelton, uh, State Representative Ben McGordy, who represents the communities of Shelton, Trumbull, and Strafford. I also have with us John Guy from Webster Bank. He handles all the PP loan applications and procedures as well as Art Corey from the Bankers Association of Connecticut. Uh, I myself, State, Rep State Senator Kevin Kelly, I represent the communities of Shelton, Seymour, Monroe, and Stratford. And you know we are in a really unusual time. Uh, our hearts go out to everyone who is affected in multitude of ways with regards to this coronavirus, both those who are infected and have had to deal with the effects of it, as well as those families who have had someone lost in their family. Uh, there's a whole host of things that are going on. And one, one of the things that we're gonna try and do tonight is deal with, uh, I'm gonna say getting Connecticut back to work and dealing with jobs and ways to protect that. But really before we can do any of that, we do need to give a heartfelt uh, thank you and gratitude, sincere gratitude to those first responders uh, that are on the front lines, both in hospitals, uh, our police and fire, as well as those in nursing homes that are dealing with individuals uh, that are affected by this virus. Uh, thank you to them and their efforts, and we sincerely owe you a huge debt of gratitude. Uh, so this is a, a, an opportunity now that we're giving to people to ask questions. Once again, tonight's focus is more, uh, I'm gonna say economic for uh, uh, Connecticut families and to look at ways to protect jobs here in Connecticut and make sure that the middle class, when this does and uh, has a place to go back to work, uh, earn a living and get their, their kitchen table economics back uh, safe and secure. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll kick it over to uh, State Representative McGordy uh, for a few words. Thank you so much, Senator, and hello to everybody tonight in your homes. Uh, my, my heart goes out to everybody, to the first responders, doctors, nurses, everybody that's um, taking care of everybody, the grocery workers, et cetera. Uh, tonight, hopefully we can get some answers for you. Uh, there's three primary financial helps for the small business in the CARES Act, the federal stimulus plan. The Paycheck Protection Program, uh, which you apply through through private banks, which we'll get some information tonight on. The Economic Injury Disaster Loans, we apply through the Small Business Administration. And the business changes for the taxes. So hopefully tonight, everybody learns a little something. And thanks for spending time with us tonight. Thank you, Senator. And uh, yeah, first of all, Kevin, thanks for, for putting this together. And, and Ben, thanks for, for joining on as well. And John and Art, thanks for participating in this. Um, you know, obviously we know about the public health aspects of this, but a lot of the questions that we get uh, that I've received, and I know Kevin and, and Ben have as well, is uh, the economic impact. And, and as Ben said, there are a lot of different options out there. And that's really what we wanted to bring to everybody tonight uh, was perhaps a better understanding of, of what some of those options are. And actually Ben had mentioned the, um, the Paycheck Protection Program. It's a federal program. And honestly, when I get a lot of questions from constituents, I have been directing them to uh, the Paycheck Protection Program. It's, it's um, like I said, a federal program, 300, right now $350 billion in federally backed loans, which can be accessed through local lenders. So businesses or general small businesses are going through their local banks to obtain this funding. Um, you know, it's uh, reserved for in general in, uh, companies with under 500 employees, um, a maximum of $10 million can be granted in loans at a rate of no more than 4% um, you know, to be paid back. And there are opportunities actually to not have to pay back those loans, assuming that, um, that a borrower actually doesn't end up laying off individuals. That's the goal of the Paycheck Protection Program is to make sure that individuals aren't laid off. Uh, but I want, I want to sort of start with a question that we received, and it was a question from Pat, which I think um, you know, maybe uh, John or Art, you can answer. And the question is this, um, after I reached out to my bank, you know, what should the expected timeline be? I reached out, I haven't heard back yet. How long should that take? And then how do I know if the bank still needs some information? So I don't know if John or Art, if you guys can address that. Well, why don't, why don't I give it a shot? Um, 
First of all, thanks for having me. And I too would like to give my thanks for all the people on the front line who are trying to make this burden a little less uh, for all of us. Um, I would add to that, um, all the bankers, um, and certainly in each of the banks across the network, uh, who are dealing with customers and trying to put together programs and support them outside of the program that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, like most of us, um, Webster is prepared and has been engaging our customers along the way and making available to them uh, things that we do routinely, payment deferrals, waiver of fees, looking at extensions of lines and other things. The PPP program, as you mentioned, gives us another tool to make available to our customers. Um, the process is very different for each institution is what I'll tell you. Uh, for many of us, we had to build a platform in a pretty short period of time to be able to handle the loans that are coming in. So I would tell you that the answer will vary based on the individual bank. And one thing that's essential and pretty consistent across lending challenges for banks is how completely the customer provides the information the first time around. What I would tell you at Webster, we're hoping to be able to respond to customers in within up to 10 business days for people who have submitted the application uh, directly, uh, correctly the first time around, that's a much shorter period of time. For a large majority of customers, we're finding we have to go back and ask for additional information because they didn't even provide it. They weren't clear on how they got to the calculation that determines the amount of money that they got. So for us right now, I would say it's up to about 10 business days, but it can go much faster if you took the time to make sure you submitted all the information requested the first time around. Uh, Rep Representative Perrell, I'll, I'll add to that. That's, that's the bankers. Oh, I was gonna say, I think that's, um, that's reflective of um, all of our member banks um, experience uh, what John just described. I did want to add, um, you were right when you said the CARES Act set, sets the interest rate at up to 4%. Fortunately, uh, what the SBA did was that they set that rate now at 1%. So, so to the extent a loan is not forgiven um, to a, a, a business borrower, um, any amounts they have to pay back will be at 1%. Okay, and actually one thing, um, I found, and you know, people can take this for what it's worth, uh, but I actually helped a few folks out with this. And I found that talking with the bank ahead of time and getting the information needed in advance, rather than just trying to cobble it together and send it off, um, really made things a lot easier. I was actually able to, in one case, you know, I, I had you know, left something out and I was able to clarify it before it was even fully submitted to SBA. And, and that really sped things along for me rather than having to go back and forth half a dozen times needing more information. Um, so I, I would urge folks to do that. Just make sure you've, if you have an accountant, talk to your accountant. If, if, if you've got a good relation with your bank or have that conversation in, in, in it's, it's um, in, to completion to make sure you're getting everything done that you need to get done in the proper way. I, I think Would it's also, some, that was the same experience that I'm finding with uh, individuals who have participated in this program is if they have a relationship with the local bank, if they talk to the bank, communicate with the bank, find out exactly what they need with the application and submit it. You know, the more work you can do up front, the more likely of success on the back end, I think will happen. Uh, I think that relationship is an important component. All right, you were going to say something. Uh, I echo that the comment about the back end. Um, you know, one of the things that we've been stressing to, uh, you know, our banks and, and businesses that we've talked to is that when it comes time to apply for forgiveness of, you know, as much of the loan as you can get forgiven, it's going to be important to have the documentation um, to do that. So, you know, re essentially records about, you know, that reflect what you spent the money on. Uh, and it, I think it's a good idea to, that you just said to talk to your bank about what that, that documentation will be like. We spend a lot of energy at the forefront of this, reaching out to customers, trying to give them direction, giving them as much structure as we can in terms of the information as we understood it. Part of the challenge is people getting people to calm themselves down. This is a really stressful period of time. And the misconception that if you get your, your application in and it's incomplete, holds you a spot is probably one that um, is misguided. Uh, what we find is if we have to touch it more than once, we have to spend more time, we have to move that off into a different group of people 
and any application that's pretty clean can go straight through. So it is to the customer's advantage to engage their banker as, as you've talked about and take time and make sure they get all the information correctly because just getting the application in partially does not hold your spot in the line. Okay, what if I've already uh, filed an application and after I've done that, I do not receive a confirmation email. I don't get anything back. What should I do next? How long should I wait? Should I reapply? Uh, what should the process be? I'll start. Um, most institutions should be giving you a response that says at least they've received the application. What we're trying to stand up at Webster is a process that not only acknowledges that you received the application, but where it moves to the next phase, whether it's complete application or we're missing some documentation. We will be sharing with the customer at what point it is ready to be submitted through the SBA system, which is where we officially get the approval and the dollars are secured. And then finally, the third phase is notifying the customer that you've cleared through approval from the SBA and we are forwarding documents with directions on how to sign them and return them to the bank. Now, I have a uh, question from Dominic T. Uh, in a condominium association, if tenants do not pay common charges because they lost work, will the PPP program help them out? Um, I can speak to that, uh, Senator. So um, it's there are many questions that are still being answered um, with respect to this program. In fact, just today, the Small Business Administration issued a, a rule that um, attempted to answer many of the questions the banking industry was posing to them. Um, one of the unanswered questions is whether homeowners associations can apply for these PPP loans. Um, so it, it looks like perhaps maybe they cannot, uh, but there are other loans that they may be eligible for. Uh, and in particular homeowners um, or unit owners in the case of condos might, um, there may be programs available to them as individuals that, that I think they would look to. So unfortunately that's, it's unclear whether the um, homeowners associations can, can avail themselves of this program, but even if they could, there are only certain things that these, the loan proceeds can be spent on. I don't think that, you know, um, uh, you know, homeowners uh, association fees, it would be one of those. Okay. Now, can applicants be approved and receive funding from multiple government sources, uh, such as the PPP program or the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program? I, I believe the answer to that question is yes. Um, what's more specific is that the dollars not be spent for the same kind of thing. In the payroll protection program, most of the costs are focused around payroll costs. As I understand it in the other program, you can use those dollars for other things. If you've already applied for the EIDP program, I, I think I got that right, um, and you subsequently apply for PPP, you can have some of those dollars um, made a part of the amount you request for the PPP. The PPP loan amount is based on two and a half times your monthly average payroll cost, but you can increase the amount by any amount that you borrowed the EI, the, uh, the, uh, the disaster program, um, and um, repay, have that part repaid from that program. If that makes sense. And isn't there a part of the, the PPP program that can be used for other things other than payroll? What are those other things that can be used? The uh, PPP program can be used for utility costs, rent and interest on your mortgage, in addition to payroll related expenses. And is there a, a cap on that? There's a cap related to how much of a salary you can include in your calculation. So any person who has a salary over 100,000, that amount over 100 cannot be included in your calculation. So the maximum you can claim for any individual that's on your payroll is $100,000. And then, uh, what about with regards to like the uh, utilities and the rent? Is there a certain amount of the, the loan that can go to that? You know, the guidelines are they really expected most of this money will be to support keeping people on your payroll or rehiring. 
um, the flexibility around the utilities and the um, rent, I, I think the guideline is that no more than 25% should be for those expenses. And is any part of the loan forgivable? The part of the loan that's forgivable is all those costs related to your payroll. Um, there are some caveats around that, that if you reduce the labor force or you reduce the uh, individual salaries by I think 25%, um, that could have an impact on how much would be forgiven. But if you spent the majority or all of the money on payroll related expenses, they would be forgiven. And that, that, is for, um, that is for an eight week period. So whatever, however much money you spend during the eight weeks after you um, get the loan on payroll and utilities, rent, mortgage interest, that's the amount that'll be forgivable. Okay, so the period is once you get the loan going forward for eight weeks. Right. And can sole proprietors, individual contractors, or self-employed individuals take advantage of this? They can. Um, and some of the, the rule I referenced before that just came out today um, provides some, some needed guidance on how those individuals um, calculate and document their payroll costs because there were some questions around that. But the answer to that is yes, they, 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 can, um, they, can, they can get a PPP loan. Wow. I've uh, actually had a lot of, um, a lot of questions from folks who are self-employed who have actually struggled with the program through their banks. Um, have you got any, you know, for example, um, one constituent said, you know, who was self-employed said that the bank wouldn't, couldn't facilitate this for her because she didn't have an account just for her business. She was self-employed and she did everything through her own personal checking account. Is that accurate? And, and if it is accurate, what can people, her, what can she and people like her do? Yeah, I, I haven't um, seen a, re a requirement in the PPP loan rule that requires an account. Um, there are other regulations that banks are subject to that some banks um, feel more comfortable there being an account, the know your customer rules, um, anti-money laundering rules, things of that nature. I think it's a good idea, by the way, to have an account at, at the institution where you're getting your loan. As I mentioned before, you're, you're gonna wanna track these, you know, what you spend these loan proceeds on so that you can get as much as you can get forgiven um, down the road. You're gonna need the documentation for that. Having a separate account for that at the institution might be really helpful in, uh, to do that. Great. Hey, John and Art, I got a question from JF. He wants to know what's with the no payments of rent and how do I pay my mortgages? With the help, um, what help is there for landlords that aren't able to pay the common water charges, the taxes and their mortgages? What's the help out there for those guys? You know, I think they're, they're, I think the disaster program should, should allow for those people to make a, uh, a, an application. That's a direct application, as you know, to the SBA. The, it's a maximum of up to $2 million. There's less restrictions around how those funds can be used. The PPP program was put in specifically to help keep people or rehire uh, employees back to the business so that when this all um, ends, they can get back up to uh, normal as fast as possible. Okay. Great. Is any any part of that that you just discussed for uh, them would that be forgivable, or is it a, a straight out loan? Again, the, on the PPP loan, no, not, program, the, not, not the PPP. No, I'm talking for, about the for the tax. landlord. Yeah, for the landlord. Landlord, they have mortgages to pay, but the rents are coming in. Uh, I'm not aware of a forgiveness component to the disaster program. Um, yeah. there, there's a uh, there's a, a, an initial ten thousand dollar advance a business that qualifies for an idle loan can get and that's that's uh, forgivable or it, it turns into a grant essentially. And I understand you get that ten thousand whether your application is denied or not. Great, thanks. Okay, uh, here's another question uh, that we've received. Uh, and it, this is a little bit off, off point. We're getting questions on other, other topics. Uh, but why is Connecticut so far behind other states for unemployment supplement? Uh, I heard Pennsylvania and New Jersey already are receiving them. Um, and from what I understand from the Department of Labor is that uh, they don't have a 
I'm going to say an up to date, up to speed uh, technology uh, capability with their computers. And so they're having, first of all, an influx of about 400,000 uh, applications for unemployment. But even the patch to get the federal funding from Washington isn't capable because there's an extra $600, as I understand it, available. So we're behind the curve, both uh, from a manpower, getting the 400,000 through the system, but also from a technological perspective, uh, there's just not a, a capability right now. And that's why you're having the delays that we're having processing the unemployment checks. But even once they're processed, we're still gonna have a problem uh, being able to patch into the federal system. Um, and that's another issue. Uh, Here's another question that we just uh, got, and this is back to like a bank issue. Um, I was approved the, the loan, and I'm assuming this is the PPP. Uh, they told me that the next step was an email with an online signature. Uh, is that from the bank or will it be coming from the federal government? And what kind of uh, backup information uh, will I need to provide? In our process, we're using a, a DocuSign capability, which allows us to send the customer the ability to see the documents electronically, sign electronically, and send those back to us. So this sounds similar to that process. It's, it's an, uh, an efficiency play that makes it easier for us than just giving all the documents, send them through the regular mail, waiting for the customer to get them, put them back in the mail, or coming by and dropping them off at one of our banking centers. So, it's, it's something that I think a lot of banks are using to try to speed it up. It certainly comes in handy in this remote environment we find ourselves working at, working at. So I would tell the customer to make sure they follow the directions. Uh, it will make it easier for them to close the loan and ultimately get the funding. And what type of uh, backup, like what is necessary? Like even with a PPP application, what does someone need to provide the bank to like document payroll? You're talking about for the initial calculation? Yes. At a minimum, you need to be able to provide a list of your employees, how much you paid them over the 12 month period of time. There's some slightly different rules if it's a seasonal business, but actually at the end of the day, the calculation is based on the average of your 12 months worth of payroll. There are 941s and other tax forms you can provide as support of that. You need to be able to show how you did the calculation. So if you had the 12 months, you can show what the average for the 12 months are times two and a half. And that's what the dollar amount for the calculation should be. Okay, I have another question from uh, Charlotte P. Uh, what is being done to support long-term care facilities in Shelton? I am a nurse and collected some N95 masks and brought them to one of the nursing homes, uh, which they needed very much. Uh, and uh, just to answer that, uh, obviously the state of Connecticut isn't doing enough to support our, uh, I'm gonna say our first line uh, personnel helping people in need. Uh, and that's obvious in the, the lack of PPE, uh, not only in nursing homes, but across the board. And, uh, you know, the state, I believe, can do better. Uh, I wish they would do better uh, because these people that do work and are the caregivers are very important and necessary. And the jobs that they're doing is just phenomenal. Uh, so uh, I wish the state's doing more. But at this point, uh, that we are where we are. Uh, any other comment on that? Yeah, just, and, and you know, being from Shelton, we all know um, we have a lot of nursing homes here. Uh, we have a lot of cases in Shelton, up over 260 at this point in the game. Um, and just about 50% of those are in our nursing homes. And, you know, fortunately, we've been able to get through private donations a number of masks, upwards of two, 3,000, um, <coughs> which have gone to our local nursing homes here in Shelton. Some have gone to the police department, ambulance service, paramedic service, et cetera. But the nursing homes have gotten uh, quite a bit. Um, but I will say, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of the folks in these nursing homes, the administrators, the frontline staff, you know, they're, they're very much aware of, of the challenge they face. Uh, you know, they, they feel terrible that there are individuals passing away in the nursing homes. 
But I will say to a person, they're all really dedicated to making this work and providing the care that's needed. Um, you know, we've been able to here in Shelton get them a lot of the equipment that they need, a lot of the protective equipment they need. Um, I don't know whether the Department of Public Health has been able to do that in other parts of the state, but we've been kind of fortunate here um, and that we've been able, able to make that happen for, for a lot of providers, if, if not all of them. Um, just one, one thing, and we, we sort of got to this a little bit, but, but we, I, was, I just received a question, um, and I guess we'll sort of throw that out to everybody, but I think it's something that's on everybody's mind. You know, before Easter, uh, you know, the governor came out and said that May 20th was his new date for when uh, businesses, non-essential businesses would be able to reopen. And that, that set a lot of people's hair on fire. Uh, that's a long time. And, and one of the questions that, that, that I just got was, do we think that date is set in stone? Do we, is, is there any movement there? And what might that plan look like um, if there is a way to phase this in versus just a drop, drop dead date, the date to flip the switch on on May 20th, and I'll sort of just put that out to the group. And, and guys from the banking community, nobody's gonna hold you to this. You're not, you know, we're not asking you for a crystal ball, but it's always nice to have some input if you feel feel like you'd like to chime in. Well, um, I, I think as everyone knows, banks um, were deemed essential uh, businesses and um, they're um, doing incredible work, I have to say, um, you know, uh, bank tellers and people that staff the branches, uh, drive-through tellers, um, people that you know service ATMs have have continued to do a great job to give people access to their money, uh, to answer uh, you know questions and concerns that customers have had. I you know I, I I see them continuing to do that through May 20th or whatever date it, it ends up being. Um, you know th these guys supermarket employees, healthcare workers, you know, on the front lines doing a great job. And, um, you know, there are, we're all affected by uh, this, this coronavirus, including uh, banks and their employees on a family and personal level. Um, but, um, you know, I haven't heard of uh, any um, major concerns um, uh, about people having access to the bank. So I think that'll continue. Yeah, I would just say, um, like every organization out there, our first priority is the health and safety of our, of our uh, employees. Um, they've adapted very well to this remote environment. It certainly has been an inconvenience for everybody. But I have to tell you, I'm absolutely amazed at the level of productivity. Uh, putting this PPP program in a remote environment in the time frame we had is really just a reflection of the commitment to the bankers, just like the other uh, frontline or deemed um, necessary um, employees and workers out there. So I think we would evaluate it based on the climate at the time, um, recognizing that we have to balance our duty to support our customers with the first priority being making sure our employees are safe um, and their families are safe and not put in jeopardy by rushing back to what used to be normal. Yeah, I think that's, that's sort of what, what, what scares a lot of folks, you know, in the early stage of this, you know, as legislators, all the feedback we got and all the questions we got were, you know, from employees who were going to get laid off or furloughed. They were from small businesses, you know, the restaurant owners, the, the you know, a couple of days later, the salon owners, uh, you know, what's going to happen to us? And here we are, you know, it's maybe a month later and, and you know, hopefully with an, an end in sight of May 20, but people still not knowing exactly what, what, um, you know, what they're going to do and what the state's going to do. Um, one of the things that kind of bothers me, and I'll throw this out to Ben and, and, and you, Kevin, is I, don't, I feel as though uh, that was a pretty big hammer the governor swung before Easter in taking us from the first week in April out to almost you know, the last week in May. That's, that's kind of a big jump, uh, especially at a point right now where we have very imperfect information. There's a sense that that curve is flattening a bit. You know, we, the numbers change every day. Um, but I think that was a real shock to a lot of small business owners and their employees who are optimistic, hey, maybe this, you know, things are starting to turn around, things are starting to get a little bit better. And then all of a sudden that just like hit them with like a brick in the face. Um, I don't know, from my vantage point, it's, it's a tough time to be critical because we all wanna be in this together, but um, I think that's a pretty big leap. And I think um, in this case, you know, a scalpel is probably better than a chainsaw. 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, the governor took a chainsaw to this plan and maybe something a little bit more thoughtful uh, may have been a better approach. I don't know if you guys are getting that kind of feedback. Well, Jason, basically we've been doing everything, the governor and the president, everything is on a two week basis. And here we are now, we've jumped over a month and a week to May 20th, which is not the course that we've been taking two weeks at a time. So yeah, it is a big leap and it's gonna hurt a lot of people. And maybe we can re rethink that and go back and say, you know what, the curve is flattening out. Maybe we can do something better, to help everybody out. But May 20th is a long time away. Uh, it is a long time. Uh, and I think that, you know, as you mentioned, Jason, we need to be uh, measured. We need to be uh, reasoned, uh, but we also need to be in this together. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that is a little bit, uh, you know, you now's not really the time to question it, but you do raise an eyebrow when you see that the governor who up until this point had always worked with the legislative leaders is now deciding not to work with uh, legislative leaders and work with uh, individuals beyond Connecticut uh, and putting together uh, committees and, and, and groups that aren't necessarily Connecticut centric, that dealing with the people of Connecticut, what, what Connecticut families are experiencing. We all wanna get through this uh, healthy and safe. Uh, and we wanna make sure that the virus is controlled and that nobody's uh, health and safety uh, is harmed. Uh, but at the same time, we do have to keep in mind that there are other elements of this and that we have to stay focused on all of them uh, at the same time. Uh, so we'll take it shortly, you know, let's take it one day at a time and, and see where it leads us. Yeah, and I think, and, and you know, you know, I come from a healthcare background. My wife is in healthcare. She's still going to work. Um, you know, I'm working from home. So, so nobody discounts, at least not in this household, nobody discounts the importance of, of um, the virus. That said, you know, I hope the governor's office still recognizes or at least has a sense that what people experience in their main street business um, really is in many ways day to day. You know, that you know, losing another week of sales matters. You know, that rent still got to get paid. Um, the mortgage at home still has to get paid. And you know, just to, I don't know, and again, I'm just really trying not to be critical, but at the same time, I, I would just, if anybody from the governor's office is watching this, um, you know, please engage the small business community. I know some individuals were named to the governor's council who's going to look at this. Um, some big business names, heavy hitters, um, which is great. Bring a lot of knowledge to the table, but uh, I hope there'll be some representation from the small business community where, where you know, you need that revenue to make, make payroll and you need that revenue to pay your rent and, and pay your home mortgage. So I just... So I, this is this is a much more it was honestly it's a little bit intellectually um simplistic just just to pick a date at the end of may it's 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 a little more nuanced than that and i hope i hope that feedback's getting to the governor's office so getting back to main street we have a couple more questions here i have a kds uh and she asked that if you applied for the ten thousand dollar grant and the ppp will the ten thousand be added to the PPP monies? So the, um, as John mentioned earlier, um, if you have an idle loan, that's where the $10,000 advance comes in. Um, and it's not, uh, well, what you could do is you could get a PPP loan by refinancing your idle loan, getting um, additional PPP money, theoretically. What'll happen with that $10,000 advance is that'll be taken off of uh, any forgiveness amount for the PPP loan. So as we said before, you know, eight, we, eight weeks worth of money that you spend on certain things, mostly payroll, that can be forgiven. Um, and let's say that's $20,000 or whatever it's going to be, then you would remove that, you would subtract the $10,000 loan advance that you got under the idle program. Okay. Uh, Another one, Cheryl C. asks, in regards to the PPP documentation, documentation, along with the employee names and the 2019 payroll, lenders are also asking for payroll information from June. Kevin froze up on my end. Yes. Uh, Did we lose Kevin? 
And let me see if I have this question. I can finish this thought. So I believe the question, bear with me and correct me if I'm wrong. I believe the question was regarding documentation um, and the period of time required for the payroll. Was that what, what Kevin was getting at? Sound like it. Okay, thanks, Sean. So, so what exactly is that period of time that, that the banks are gonna need in order to process these loans? Uh, <clears throat> it's my understanding and, and what we've been telling people is you have to be able to provide 12 months worth of payroll cost with detail by individual that you pay. Uh, it's different for seasonal businesses. And I don't remember specifically what that variation is, but it, the calculation is based on the average of that 12 months. So I think at a minimum, you got to demonstrate how many people you paid, what did you pay them for the preceding 12, for, for a year, 12 months. Okay. Now what advice, I mean, cause you've got, um, I always sort of think that, that accountants and realtors and, and bankers have a good sense of what's going on in the economy. You're, you're, you're touching um, businesses right where they are. What is, I, I'm going I'm to bleed you guys for free advice for our constituents. What are a few things you're asking customers um, to keep in mind um, as they're going through this? What are some so, you know, a couple things they should be keeping in the back of their head, some tools that they might be able to leverage that perhaps they haven't thought of? What are some first things they should be thinking of? Wow, I think, you know, one of the things that you always want people to think about is, um, you know, in the end day, this is all about cash flow. Uh, trying to understand where you may have some unnecessary expenses or things that are nice to versus absolutely need to have. Um, uh, I think it's no different than you would do in your own individual household when things get tight is try to figure out where are the things that you absolutely have to have or need to have on a going forward basis and what are the things you can give up are there opportunities to um, maybe reduce hours rather than uh, dismiss people completely um, so I think there's there's no magic to it and it's a very different for each individual company um, but those are some of the first things I, I always think about. And what are things that are nice to have versus those things that are absolutely necessary for you to be able to um, conduct business mm -hmm. in this more scarce environment, or if not at all, um, to maintain your engagement with your employees? Are there some other creative things that you could do? You know, in the restaurant business, one of the first things they did was go to takeout. Mm -hmm. Now, not everybody had a takeout menu, but some people will come out of this having developed a better capability around that. Yeah. Um, some people are adjusting their processes to do things to help support the frontline people. Um, we have a customer who created a, a device that will enable multiple ventilators to work to different patients, uh, 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 excuse me, multiple patients to use one ventilator. You see people um, doing uh, masks and garments and things like that. So I think those are things that uh, people have done and should consider in addition to looking at uh, what are things that are absolutely necessary for them to maintain. Um, the business and their lifestyle at a minimum. Another question I've actually, actually not a question, but um, what a lot of constituents are, especially in the restaurant industry, it seems that's the, the feedback I've gotten. One of the questions they're going through in their own minds, whether they're determining to move forward with the uh, Paycheck Protection Program or not, is a sense of uncertainty as to whether or not those loans will actually be forgiven. Um, I talk to a lot of folks who, who basically say this seems too good to be true. You know, I see a scenario where I don't have to lay anybody off, you know, for the next six months, 12 months, and they're just going to give me this money. Everybody sort of feels that at the end of the day, they're going to get stuck paying this money back. Are, what's your sense of that? And I'm not asking you to represent the federal government, but what, what are you guys hearing? I mean, are, 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 is the banking community concerned that um, this issue could arise? So the, the, I mean, the message from all the way from Treasury Secretary, probably the president, but Pre Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, who, um, you know, his, the Treasury obviously governs the Small Business Administration through the Small Business Administration is that, you know, they, they've been tasked by Congress to get this money out on the street, um, sort of been <laughs> equating this thing you know, uh, creating this PPP loan program in particular to, you know, building the airplane as it's taking off. 
uh, and the government knows there are a lot of unanswered questions. Um, the message is that there's going to be a lot of flexibility and understanding with um, you know these loans and how these things get done. But I mean, the law the law requires forgiveness. Um, you know, I, I think there will be a lot of understanding and flexibility. But I, I would urge uh, anyone who obtains one of these loans, you know, documentation, documentation, documentation. You know, making sure you keep track of whatever you're spending that money on, so that you maximize uh, the amount of forgiveness that that you'll get, and, and try to understand through uh, your banker, um, you know, what that documentation is going to be. It's it's going to be mostly the documentation that um, the bank gathered to calculate. Uh, your payroll and confirm your payroll costs for determining the amount of the loan. So I, I, I'd urge, I, I, so I, I, my sense is that um, there's not going to be a pullback. You know, nobody's going to be, you know, pulling the rug out from anybody from the government side to, um, to take away loan forgiveness. I think that will largely um, be fine. Um, there may be abuses, you know, where that, that doesn't happen, but um, you know, where, where there's fraud or whatever, but um, that's going to be few and far between, I think. So um, yeah, plan and, and document. Thanks a lot. Yeah, from the bank standpoint, that's our absolutely, uh, that's where our major focus on is making sure we can show that we did our part and that the customer did provide the appropriate documentation. I think another view here is um, the government is sitting there thinking if we can keep people on the payroll, the economy will have a faster start. And those sort of same people would be on unemployment. So these are dollars that are being spent to try to make certain that we're in the best position to restart the economy. Otherwise, as you've seen evidence every day, these would be people would be, they would be paying out in a different form through unemployment. So this is a better way to use those dollars. Great, thanks. Kevin, you got on mute, buddy. I am experiencing, not experienced, uh, some technological difficulties here, but uh, I wanted to thank both uh, Art and John uh, for being with us uh, this evening and for providing some much needed information for individuals uh, and also to just Webster Bank and the Connecticut Bankers Association for their help throughout this process. Uh, you've been answering a lot of constituents' questions. And as this unfolds, continue to send us our emails. Uh, call the office if you have any questions. Uh, you know, we're, we're here to help and to put people in contact with uh, individuals who can help them out in their certain circumstances. Uh, anything else, uh, Jason or Ben? Just thank you, everybody, for sharing your evening with us. And uh, Art and John, thank you so much for your time. And Senator thank Kelly you. And Jason, yeah, thank you. Guys, thanks very much. I know you didn't have anything else going on at, at seven yeah. o'clock on a Tuesday night. This is exactly where you wanted to be with us. Um, but we appreciate and our constituation, uh, constituents appreciate it as well. And um, we'll, you know, for folks out there who are watching, uh, keep an eye out as, as things change, as new information becomes available, we're going to try and take the opp opportunity to do more of these uh, to offer new information as it comes out. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Have a nice evening.